Two minutes for the opening statement, two minutes for the answer, two minutes for a closing statement. Uh, we're going to begin uh, shortly. We're going to start with Mr. Cardamone, uh, who asked the questions from my far right all the way down to Ms. Randall here. And in reality, it's not really a definitive debate as much as a question and answer, but you feel free to challenge any of the questions uh, with your opponent, okay? or with me for that matter. <laughs> okay? uh, with no further ado, let me start by introducing all, or having the candidates introduce themselves with their opening statements. And we'll start to my far right with uh, Mr. Cardamone. Uh, thanks, Joe. Uh, I, uh, I told, my name is Joe Cardamone, and I, I told Joe I never met a Joe that I didn't like, and he's been very cooperative with us to, uh, to be here today. I'm, I'm happy to be with my, my fellow candidates here that, uh, for the office of mayor. I would, uh, I would like to let the, uh, the citizens know that um, I'm a third generation uh, citizen here of Scranton, uh, raised in the north end of town in a small section uh, called Bull's Head. And uh, I think as we go into the night tonight, I'd like to uh, keep everybody uh, aware of, uh, remind them of a, a novel that I think we've all read in high school uh, by Charles Dickens. And the novel is about a tale of two cities. And it starts off, uh, these are the best of times and these are the worst of times. And I think as we move on in the night, uh, from me, you're going to hear my responses to why, why we are, why it is the worst of times for us now, and how do we, and how do I propose as your mayor to make it the best of times, and as far as the best of times as your mayor, what I'm going to propose to make it even better. Uh, with that being said, uh, I, I want to end, close my uh, opening statement with uh, uh, the reason I want to be your mayor is simply because I want to be your mayor. Just like you, the people of the city here that are professional people or non-professional people, lawyers, uh, mechanics, uh, healthcare workers, you are what you are because you want to be that profession. So my passion and my drive is simply after being here and being involved in the city for the last 40 plus years, um, I simply want to be your mayor. Thank you. And, and Mr. Courtright will be next. Thank you, and thank you for having us here this evening. My name is Bill Courtright, and I am a candidate for the mayor of the city of Scranton. I'm a lifelong resident here, lived here my entire life. I'm uh, married, and my wife Kim is in the audience there, my daughter Lindsay. Uh, we've been married for 32 years, and my wife also is a lifelong resident of the city of Scranton. I have three children, uh, son Bill, who's an attorney in this area here, a son Patrick, did, uh, Friday just finished up his second uh, year at the medical school here in Scranton, and a daughter Lindsay, uh, who we say belongs to the noblest of profession, she's a school teacher. Uh, me personally, I worked for 18 years for a company called Train Corporation, where I traveled extensively throughout the United States for train, and at the time, uh, my personal budget for my department alone was $1.5 million. At the same time the train, uh, I was working at train, I operated a small business in the city of Scranton, which I continued to do so uh, over 30 years. Uh, I served on the Civil Service Commission under Mayor Jim Connors, along with Joe Cardamone. And I served for approximately nine years. I was appointed by the governor approximately nine years ago to MOPEC Commission, which is the Municipal Police Officer Education and Training Commission. And we governed all the police academies throughout the state of Pennsylvania. We determined the curriculum, and we determined what they call updates that the police have to go through each and every year. Uh, I currently am a tax collector where I've enjoyed great success. The first year that I was in the tax office, we collected $5 million more in additional revenue than the previous year. Uh, we discovered over $600,000 that belonged to the, the city of Scranton, which we uh, turned over to them, and over $429,000 uh, for the Scranton School District, which uh, Superintendent King said we probably saved all day kindergarten. Uh, at the time that I took over the tax office, the computer system was uh, 90 some percent capacity and ready to crash and what we had to do is and I'm not a computer ex expert we had to go in uh, split it out and the system was backed up sporadically at best at the time and each and every night now two discs are taken off site and the event of a catastrophe in the tax office we have all the information and I got the stop card there okay thank you Mr. Morgan is next um, yes good evening my name is Lee Morgan uh, my qualifications for mayor are that um, I've attended various city-based meetings for over 20 years, probably moving closer to 30. Um, 
I'm Vice President of the Scranton Lackawanna Taxpayers and Citizens Association. I'm the President of Fathers for Families and Mothers Too, um, which has to do with custody issues and a watchdog of uh, the Court of Common Pleas Family Court. Um, I'm involved in so many numerous uh, endeavors in the city um, that, you know, it's just I've, I've just based my whole life on knowledge of the community and the county and government. And um, I'm just running for mayor because I think it's time for politics to end. I think it's time for leadership to begin. I think the community uh, deserves an opportunity to begin the process of turning this city around. And I just think that we've had uh, too many false starts and I really believe that um, Scrantonians have reached the point where they're so downtrodden by the political situation in the city that they've just stopped dreaming of a better day. And uh, that is evident in the population drop in the city since the 1920s, where our population was over 130,000 people. And if people understand that Scranton began as a grist mill off the Roaring Brook and managed to grow to this size, I think it's time to try to find our roots and go back to uh, work to help the residents. And Leslie, uh, Liz Randall. Thank you all. Thank you to ECTV for hosting this and good evening to my fellow candidates. I'm Liz Randall. I am running for mayor of Scranton. Uh, my story is a little bit different than perhaps my, my colleagues to my right. Uh, I moved here 12 years ago on the cusp of my 30th birthday. and when uh, I was a little bit younger, had set out to hit four goals as a 30-year-old. As a so by the time I was 30, I wanted to have a full-time job, own my own house, have my PhD in hand, and to have my private pilot's license. Uh, and so those four things I managed to do, and, uh, but two of them were the most significant because 12 years ago is when I moved to Scranton. So I moved here uh, to work at the University of Scranton as a faculty member in the philosophy department. I ran the Campus Women's Center. Uh, and I also bought my first house ever in Southside when I moved here. Um, and I didn't realize at the time that I was moving to a place that I would absolutely fall head over heels in love with, that I chose to move to, that I've chosen to stay in, and now I've chosen to run for mayor. Part of the reason that I am running, however, is that in the past couple of years I've known or noticed a dwindling sense of confidence and growing anxiety in terms of the people that live in the city. And that's, that's alarming and worrisome to me because it's starting to turn into a community that uh, that I don't recognize anymore and that was not necessarily the same place that I moved to and fell in love with. One of the things that I like to think is that people get to live in communities in ways that is not synonymous with what might be going on in their government. So if we have a crisis in City Hall, my hope would be to put the flak jacket on to make sure that we proceed uh, responsibly and uh, and intelligently with a, with a good plan and make sure that everybody gets to live the rest of their lives in this community, making the city a better place. Uh, I do believe that I have the leadership capabilities uh, to lead the city. I have a good skill set and experience. I have a good 360 degree perspective of the city. I've worked in higher education with nonprofits in the private sector and in government both at the county and the, and the state level. So that's why I'm running. Thanks. Thank you very much if you'd pass the microphone down. And before we continue, or I should say start with the questions, uh, we do have a studio audience here this evening, and uh, part of the rules are going to be it's okay to applaud after the opening statements for everybody, because I think they all did a good job. And we can do it again at the closing statement. But in between, <laughs> if we want to get out of here in about an hour, we'll just answer, ask and answer the questions. And I'm going to start with Mr. Uh, Mr. Cardamone down at the end there. Uh, you kind of alluded to this a little bit in your opening statement. Actually, everybody did a little bit. But why should the uh, residents of Scranton uh, vote for you uh, instead of one of your opponents? I look back at um, I, I look back at the forty last forty years of uh, our city being a a home rule charter city. Uh, we be we became that in 1975 by vote, and. Over the last, the last 40 years, I have been involved in the community as far as political, uh, political activity and community helping as far as neighborhood association. During that time, I've been on, I've been on both sides of the fence. I've helped uh, Republicans and I've helped Democrats. I've been on some uh, 
losing teams and I've been on some winning teams. Uh, I've, we've cried together, uh, we've laughed together in this community and I think the people have a, a, a lot of the people are still, still around that are my age with their own children, uh, some of them with their grandchildren. Uh, with, that, with that being said, um, the, the, the office of the mayor needs somebody that has experience. And in the 40 years uh, of my experience in, in the working world here in the city, uh, 10 of those years I've been in the classroom. I still am in the classroom now as an educator or part-time part -time substitute teacher. I've been in the private sector as a management level, administrative level for 10 years. Uh, currently, currently, the last 10 years I've been in the healthcare business as an administrator for uh, nursing homes and personal care homes. Um, However, the most important experience I've had was in, during the 90s when I was the Director of Community Development and as uh, Mr. Courtright alluded, him and I were on the civil service together and also in that time I was the Chief Executive Officer of Oliphant Borough, Scott Township and Kubaugh Township. And I think that experience of, is very much needed uh, as the officer to become the mayor, as your mayor, that's very much ex experience that is needed in the office that you have the ability you're coming in pretty much coming in running. I'm not going to learn on the job. Thank you. First, I'd like to say that you know, my roots are here. <clears throat> my entire family has been here their whole lives. And uh, I, I never even thought about leaving Scranton. I volunteered on several things, as Joe mentioned. We were on a civil service commission together. It was a volunteer type thing, no pay. Nine years I traveled throughout the state of Pennsylvania for the MOPEC Commission, again, volunteer, because I had concern for what was going on. I have a business here for over 30 years, and, and it's a small business and it struggles, but I, I didn't give up. I think one of the, the reasons is, is that I spent six years on Scranton City Council, and I've said it time and time again, that, that's an education that no book or no school could give me. Uh, any of you have ever watched Grand City Council, I, I think you would have to agree. But I had the opportunity to see how each and every department operates. I, I know how each and every department operates. Uh, it's not going to be a learning curve for me. I'm going to be able to hit the ground running. I, I don't think it's time for on-the-job training. Uh, I've worked on budgets, at least six of them for the City of Scranton, so I know the process. Also. I have a track record. I mean, I don't think the people are going to have to say, Ooh, we didn't know he was going to be like that. They watched me on live TV for six years. They know how I'm going to be. They know my demeanor. They know what I'm like. I think they know I'm honest. I'm hardworking. Uh, and my track record in, in, in the tax office has is, is been great. And, and not just solely because of me, but because of the employees I have. And be able to put the right employees in the right position. I have almost all unionized employees in my office. And we've been able to have such great success without having one union grievance in the entire time that I've been there. So we've been successful, we've been able to get along together. I think I, I'm going to be able, I'm a person that can communicate. And I think that's something that's been lacking in city government here for several years now, communication between the mayor and, and, and the city council. And I believe that I will be able to do that with no problem. They, people ask, will you go to city council? As if you would be afraid to go there. Well, I spent six years there, so it, it doesn't really, it doesn't really concern me. And I got the stop thing again there. Thank you. fast going fast well the reason I'm running for mayor is that um, I have a very strong grasp of what's occurred in the city because I've attended these council meetings for over two decades and um, the things that have happened have been very startling to say the least the city's wage tax is 2.4 percent the realty transfer tax 4.4 percent unemployment's 9.8 there's a $100 million shortfall in the city's municipal pensions, $148 million in long-term debt. We're not talking about the parking authority debt. We're not talking about the sewer authority debt. Um, sale of the Southside Sports Complex, sale of the municipal golf course, um, just a complete looting of the city over a protracted period of time by the political leadership in the city. And I think what's really happened, if I was a person living outside the city of Scranton, I wouldn't be a happy person because not only has it drugged the city down, but it's caused massive harm to the communities around the city because no one wants to move their assets anywhere near Scranton. And I just think that when we listen to politicians talk about all the great things they've done, like the downtown, 
Well, now we're making the downtown into neighborhoods. But we've allowed the neighborhoods themselves to diminish to the point where there's so many condemnations. And, you know, the only time that any money gets spent in the city is when there's grants or gifts to the city. And the city isn't investing in itself. And it hasn't for a very long time. And I just think that the answers are real simple. We've got to break that cycle. And I think I have the knowledge to make that happen, the ability to make that happen, and the commitment to make that happen. Thank you. I think the, the why I'm asking for people's vote is, is several fold. Um, I'll start with the fact that, uh, again, I'm not from here. And although I continue to bring that up, I think it's important because when people know me and the people that do know me and the varied and diverse base of support that I enjoy and have enjoyed not only when I ran for commissioner but certainly with this endeavor running for Mayor Scranton uh, speaks to the fact that people who do know me know me because of my work product. I did not grow up here. People didn't know me as a kid. I didn't have coaches here. I didn't have doctors here. Um, I didn't have family members that knew other people in the community and so in that way you know where I come from is based on what do you do when you get into an office, a position, whether it's volunteer, hired, uh, et cetera. I think that those are, it's, an invari it's a very important thing to look at how someone does the job that they were chosen to do, hired to do, or elected to do. Uh, what I will, however, say is that I will take some issue with, um, with my, uh, one of my challengers, Mr. Courtright. Um, you know, the, the claim that of finding $5 million, collecting $5 million, finding additional monies, all of that was found uh, in the 2008 with the $12 million, and those were disbursements that were made, which is, which is good, uh, but that there was no additional collection, nor was there an opportunity to, um, you know, to bring in additional revenues, because those are not reflected overall in the budgets. Um, and I do think that if you're talking about track records, we need to be very clear about what it is that we're looking at. If we're looking at how someone performs the duties that they were assigned, whether um, it's to entrust that they do a better job in that office, whether it's on city council or in the tax collector's office, violating state law, not abiding by the recommendations of the audit that was presented um, to that, that office, I think is something that we need to take very seriously when we look at how we understand someone's track record and why it is that they want to be mayor. I think I know that I have a plan. Uh, I have a good track record here. Uh, the people that support me and back me uh, know that, and uh, so that's why I'm asking for your vote. Pass the uh, microphone to Mr. Courtright. Now, if anybody needs the, the question, yeah, I, I'd like to just, comment. I, 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 she's wrong. Finish, please. I, you can you can rebut in a second. If anybody needs a question. Uh, Repeated, you know, feel free to ask me. Uh, Mr. Cartwright, go ahead, you can rebut to that. I, I, you know, Ms. Randall's wrong. The money was found in 2010. But if you're talking about the job today, I would ask Ms. Randall, were you in a bar in the hill section the night your gun was lost and it fell out of your purse? Could you answer that question for me? Because I think we have a mutual friend that knows the answer to that. Is that true? It's not true. You were not at a bar the night you lost your gun? No. I, I take exception with that. I, I believe that was the case. And Evidently, we're going to have to bring somebody forward to verify that. Uh, okay, I'll take. Okay, this. the next question. Uh, this question goes to Mr. Courtright uh, first. What do you see as the role of the municipal unions, speaking of several, several mentioned unions, in Scranton's financial recovery process in the future? Well, I, I think I think right now everybody's aware of the fact that you know there was a thirty million dollar arbitration award, and I think that happened due to the fact there was no communication between the mayor and the unions. If I take a look at the um, the mayor, I believe it was Rhode Island, I think he said the, the way he brought them back was, you know, communication uh, uh, between the unions that were there with their pensions and whatnot. So th the role of the unions is, is, is prominent, and I think we need to work with the unions, all right, to try to, to try to foster a spirit of cooperation, because we saw what happens when, when there was no communication, a $30 million arbitration award. We, we can't afford to have that again. So I, I, I think there's an important role there. They... Mayor Doherty has given the police and fire unions contracts, I believe, through 2017. Uh, so I don't know if there's much that we can do with those contracts. There's a contract coming up for the uh, DPW union, and again, it'll be up to the mayor and city council what, what they do with that. But I think the role of the unions in, in financial uh, stability or problems in the city is significant. Thank you. Can I ask that? Sure. The, uh, the question is, what do you see as the role of municipal unions? in Scranton's financial recovery process going forward? Well, the part that I see the city's unions playing in the future of this city is that um, 
they have to learn to work with the residents. Um, I don't I don't find any problem with the rank and file union uh, employees. Uh, their leadership has really brought us to where we are today because they've backed mayoral candidates who they could get things from in contracts for a long period of time. And it's really hurt us. It's, it's stifled our ability to uh, redevelop Scranton and grow Scranton out. Um, you know, weak mayoral uh, candidates equal weak mayors. Um, and that's what's happened to this city because nobody had the desire to tell the residents the truth about where the city was. Um, I also believe that it's wrong for the residents to believe that we can uh, right this ship, Scranton, financially by uh, asking for concessions from employees because uh, it's, not the, it's not the union employees that are causing the problems for the city. It's the union leadership. And I've negotiated union contracts myself over Local 229 and over the shop store where I worked. So I am, uh, I have a lot of respect for union workers, but sometimes I think that uh, they play such, the, the union leaders want what they want and they'll do whatever they need to do to get it. And if you look at the city now, you can see where it's taken us. I think that the, the role of the unions uh, in terms of Scranton's financial recovery is significant. If we look at the budget, uh, certainly with the recent awards that are due to the police and fire unions, you're looking at an overall, probably somewhere in the vicinity of 85% of the overall city's budget is comprised of salaries and benefits. And that is an extraordinary <clears throat> excuse me, hit that the city needs to take and needs to be able to make up if we're going to be able to figure out how we run a city on the remaining 15% that we're pulling in in addition to our, uh, our, the, the, debt, the debt service that we're paying um, and all the other services that we provide as a city. I think uh, there are a couple of things that I'll say. I mean, I think that uh, making sure that we do have good communication, open lines of communication with the unions is important. I think certainly making sure that everyone is not only uh, compensated and reimbursed, uh, we don't, I'm not interested in taking food off of anybody's table, but at the same time, if you look at the things that structurally are, are contributing to our overall financial crisis, it has to do with things like um, how the health care uh, is managed, our pension structure, overtime issues, longevity pay, uh, workers' comp, disability. We're looking at a whole host of things that have to do primarily with the personnel, whether they're unionized or not, in the city, uh, and making sure that we not only are attending to those things that we might be able to immediately get in return, whether it's asking for concessions, even though the contracts are signed until 2017, uh, it would be a dereliction of duty to not ask for some of those conversations. At the same time, I think we need to look at some of the structural uh, questions and issues at hand in order to make sure that we move the city forward uh, in a way that we can maintain some kind of financial stability and, and health. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Morgan no, is next, sorry. and Mr. Morgan, Go ahead. Mm -hmm. are you ready? Yes. Uh, I, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Joe. I don't want to leave you out, Joe, because you're you're a Joe too. Remember? Yes, this, yes we okay. said we, we never met a Joe we didn't like. That's right, right Joe. Okay. I still like it. <laughs> Do I get an extra five minutes for that now, Joe? Two. I believe that when the award was given to the unions, uh, the first. I would have loved to have been in that Supreme Court room because I think they, they had the look of the deer in the headlights when the Supreme Court announced $30 million. Uh, with that being said, they came back to the governing body, the unions, and made a proposal to them, the mayor and council, as the governing body of the city. And they said, you know what, we don't want $30 million. We'll take $15 million. And I believe that, I truly believe that that was the first volley, that was a shot across the bow from the unions to the mayor and council, the governing body, that they realized that their salaries, their yearly salaries, are in the area of 42000 to 62000 a year. When the rest of the city res residents, their salaries average from 22000 to 28000 Now, some people, you might wonder where I'm getting these numbers from, but they've been reported in the Scranton Times that that's what we're faced with. And that 75 to 85 percent labor cost that we're dealing with and that other 15 percent that's just sitting there what do we use that for well 
that other 15% that's, that's being used, uh, every time I drive over a pothole, or sometimes it's a mine subsidence, mm -hmm. I think of that 15%, and I also think of that 85% going to the unions. As your mayor, after I make my inaugural address, I will go into City Hall and I will ask the unions to come and sit with me in front of the cameras, in front of the ECTV cameras, in City Hall, in the council chambers, and let's be transparent. Let's tell the people of the city what we're going to do and how, how we're going to bridge that gap between salaries for the union workers, the city workers, and the city residents. I'll get it right this time, right. Mr. Morgan. I'm sorry. Sure. <laughs> but Mr. Morgan, I believe you mentioned assets coming into the city and and uh, some of the bl some of the blight that maybe the city mm -hmm. has uh, incurred in the last decade or so. So, what would you do to improve the current blighted neighborhoods so they don't continue to negatively impact the market value of real estate in the city of Scranton? <clears throat> well, I I I think the road ahead is uh, really hard. The realty. Uh, so Scranton, Greater Scranton Realtors Association, I had a meeting with them. Um, and I think we need to stop lying to people and coming up with half-truths because the truth of the matter is we need to build a partnership with Austin Burke. We need to ask the state legislature to allow Scranton to have an enterprise zone that's only, and, um, only two A cities can uh, be part of and we're the only one. And I think that if we do that, the state will come forward and fund. Our major problem is that we lack jobs, and we've elected people that lacked vision. I think that uh, we need Scranton Abington Planning Association's comprehensive plan because uh, that will redevelop the uh, industrial parks in Dunmore and Scranton. And uh, our major problem is jobs. Uh, we can't keep talking about, you know, the percentage of wages that go to city employees because our population decline has been so great over a, such a long period of time. And the people that are leaving are people's children, okay? And that's the problem because we have all these institutions of higher learning and they graduate and they leave because we aren't offering them opportunity. And in order to offer them opportunity, those are the answers. I think if there's a question that has come up repeatedly or that I've heard, whether it's knocking on doors, I was actually last night at the first meeting, the first organizing meeting at the new uh, North Scranton Neighborhood Watch Association, and amongst other things, the issue of blight comes up over and over and over again. I think uh, it's important that we look at the funding that we get from the federal government in uh, the Office of uh, the Office of Economic and Community Development. We do have access to community development block grant funding. That provides us with the ability to, uh, to pave roads uh, and to help with some of the blight situation uh, in, in the neighborhoods. I think everybody has that one house on their block that they know if they could just flip it, turn it around, it would make and improve the entire landscape of even if it's just for that one block, if not more significantly for the neighborhood. I think um, uh, in addition to that, there, are, there have been some very aggressive and proactive pieces of legislation that the state has passed recently, even with is recently as 2012, but I, I don't believe we are being as proactive about utilizing those particular legislative tools in order to make sure not only that we can continue to demolish the plated properties, but it also enables us to hold the feet to the fire of the, uh, the vacant landlords and, uh, and, not, and in addition to that, getting those properties back on the tax rolls. As we know, there are a lot of properties that have been taken down. The, uh, the buildings are gone, but the property is not, it just languishes uh, for a while. And so we now have some better ability to do that. And I think that primarily comes out of the Office of, of Permits, Licensing, and Inspections. And I think that as I was listening to the, some of the conversation in North Scranton last night, uh, some of it has to do with, I think, also making sure that we have better communication between the police officers that are some of the beat cops that are helping with the neighborhood groups that are identifying these properties and making sure that with the three strikes you're out, with the violations when you can really go in and, and, uh, and hold somebody's feet to the fire that there's good communication between the police department and permits licensing and inspections to make sure that they, uh, that, that they get those three strikes. Oh, I keep it. You got it. Uh, under the Connors administration, I was the director of community development 
And what he had established, Mayor Connors, uh, a carryover from, uh, he was the Director of Community Development for the Wenzel administration. And he carried over some uh, policies and procedures and he had put, had, he was able to get some uh, ordinances put in place regarding uh, blight in the neighborhood uh, through, the, through the council when he was mayor. What, he what was established uh, was that there was uh, a communication, what he established is a communication between the neighborhood associations, a very, very important part of the city, uh, of the city and, and, and what we are all about. What they are are the watchdogs, the eyes of the neighborhood. Uh, from my experience with the neighborhood people, and there were some very active, very aggressive neighborhood people, uh, they would call, they would call the Office of Community Development, and they would say to us that Mr. Absentee Landlord is in his house, and come out and get him now. Bring the police with you uh, and, and serve him with a warrant because he just does not uh, participate and his house is falling apart. He's here to collect the rent, come and get him. With that being said, with that being said, the uh, the blight the blight in the neighborhoods attract uh, a, a, a very uh, unsavory, unwanted type of person into the area here. Uh, transient type of people that come in and do their business, look for some shelter to go to in these in these apartments, and once they do their business, they're hidden in there. They get in their cars and they're back to New York and Philadelphia. And along with that, it uh, brings a lot more trouble, uh, which starts with uh, the blight in the neighborhood. I think any of us that, that have run for office, when, when, you, when you go through the city, you know, you're, you're, you're usually driving. And, and you know the city and you see it. But when you're walking and you're knocking on doors, you get, you get a different perspective of what the city's like. You know, you, you'll go on a street. Southside sometimes, in my opinion, gets a bad rap. You know, everybody says, oh, Southside, this and that. Well, there's some beautiful homes in Southside, some older homes that were well taken care of. But you'll get on a block where everybody's taking care of their house, and you'll have that one house that is just a mess. Uh, I think, if possible, rather than tearing down these homes, if somehow they were mentioned OECD, maybe we can get some money through OECD and rehab some of these houses. I was on a street over in... Uh, West Grant, and I, I believe it was Bromley Avenue, Bromley or High Park Avenue, and the guy came out and said, boy, your, your house is really nice. It was an older home. He did a good job on it. He said, yeah, and I bought that house over there, and he bought that house, and he rehabbed that because he was concerned about his neighborhood. He didn't want somebody to move into that neighborhood and, and it be run down. And there was another house going out for sale down there, and he said, I think I'm going to buy that one. He said, because I'll be damned if I'm going to let somebody come in from out of town and ruin my neighborhood. And, and that's what we need. You know, those of us that love this town, which I'm sure everybody up here does, we, we need, to, need to take stock in this city and, and start doing things for ourselves. Mr. Morgan mentioned the Board of Realtors. I think we all spoke to them. One of the things they said to me is when they go to get somebody to buy a house that comes to them, they say, anywhere but Scranton. We have to change that attitude of anywhere but Scranton. There, there's good people here. I think our biggest asset is the, the people in the city of Scranton. And, and blight is certainly an issue. It does bring undesirables. So back when the Connors administration was there, I think the neighborhood groups were very, very active. I think that's gone down. I mean, they're starting to come back now, but I, I, I think that they're an important part of the city and neighborhood group. As Joe said, they could be the watchdog, but if we could possibly rehab them rather than tear them down, because we end up with overgrown grass, rats, snakes, and then the people are coming to council meeting complaining about the rats and snakes and the thing. So I think if we could try to rehab them with some of the OECD money, I, I, think, I think that would be a good thing for the city. And okay, got to stop button again. <laughs> Well, sometimes you can finish your sentence. All right. Okay. Go <laughs> We're not that hard-hearted here. Uh, Liz, I'll oh, I'll start next. Okay. You know, keeping us, maybe we'll keep along those uh, themes of uh, blighted properties and, and uh, decay. Uh, so, Liz, we'll, Ms. Randall, I should, would ask you, aside from legislation or grant money, what do you think the city can do to encourage property owners to improve their, just to improve the appearance of their property? Well, I mean, I, I think that, that that has a lot to do with what the city does do in order to, to contribute to the overall livability of the city. I think that, um, you know, Bill had also, we keep going back and forth on the OECD thing, but certainly that's where a lot of money does come from. It is restricted, however, to low to moderate income areas of the city. Uh, it may actually be that the majority of the city at this point may perhaps be almost entirely low to moderate income. We do have the ability to seek uh, gaming money as well. 
uh, in order to, to, that's a far less restrictive source of funding. Um, but I do think that a lot of it has to do with the livability of the city, how easily people can walk on the sidewalks, uh, what kinds of pride that they take, not only in their immediate neighborhood, but also in the things that are going on around them. So I think I, I live on South Webster. I was involved with the Elm Street project uh, that's being managed by um, United Neighborhood Centers, and they're working to increase the livability, if you will, of Cedar Avenue. Uh, they're trying to do something similar on Main Avenue and West Side. And I think those kinds of initiatives are things that start spilling over when you have nonprofit organizations, volunteer groups that are taking time, initiative, resources, and energy to put back into their own neighborhood. So I think that certainly a partnership with the city and us being as not only as aggressive as we can with grant money, but in addition to that, making sure that there is some allocation in the city's operating budget. I know we're talking about almost a de minimis amount of money, but definitely making a decision to set money aside for that, I think is important. But more importantly, it really comes from some of the, the, the initiative that the people have, the person that Bill met the other day. I think a couple, many of us probably know people like that who want to make sure that they are buying other properties, they're rehabbing them, they're taking that initiative. So what are the ways that the city can be most effective in making sure that those relationships and that kind of movement is facilitated and supported? A thank you, citizens of Scranton, for, for putting 75 to 85% of your household budget into your property and the extra 15 percent that's left over you're taking your kids out for ice cream your wife out to the movies uh, extracurricular activity that's one thing that the city hall has not been able to do that is why the city is looking the way it is right now so I can only simply say to the people of the city thank you for taking care of your properties budgeting your household income properly and putting, putting uh, the neighborhoods, making the neighborhoods, continuing to make the neighborhoods beautiful and vibrant. And, and, if there's, and if there's any reason that you need extra money to improve your properties, uh, there is a good banking community here in the city. Uh, there is some nonprofit community, uh, nonprofit organizations that offer some great stimulate, stimulate stimulant packages for your properties. So uh, all I can say again, uh, to, for the sake of repeating myself, as your mayor, uh, I thank you very much for continuing to do what you're doing. And as your mayor, I'm gonna stay there with you to continue keeping the improvement into your properties and not have 75% go to waste and 25% go to improvements. So I, I believe the question was what the city could do without using right, funds, right? Encourage. Uh, I, I saw a couple things happen over the past couple of years. I believe it's Judge Boyle, Margie Biggs, and Annie Boyle. On Main Avenue, she took a property in North Scranton, and they beautified it. it was it tore, I think the uh, building might have burned down, if I'm not mistaken. And they put flowers in there and everything. So there's, there's a community leader doing it. I know in South Scranton, uh, former Magistrate Russell and, and a gentleman by the name of Pat Hinton, they go throughout Southside and clean up lots over there. And, and I've gone over there, and I've done, I've done that with them. Uh, this Saturday, we cleaned up lots down in uh, the Capals Avenue area. But what I saw happen in Southside is when they see magistrate, well he was magistrate I believe at the time out there cleaning these lots up and it's, it was a lot that was really you need a lot of hard work there's like 10 of us and, and, and really working hard at it but then once it was cleaned up the neighbors on either side of that lot they start taking care of it once we did the heavy lifting so us as community leaders if we come out there and do it again we're talking not using money if we can go out there and show that you know we want to help Maybe the neighbors will start helping too, because I, I just keep going back to this. We, we've got good people in this town, hardworking people, you know, people that are, yeah, they're disgusted that the city's the way it is, but, but they're not giving up. So I, th I think as those of us that are leaders, we need, we need to show, uh, show and lead by example. Thank you. Well, if you're going to ask property owners to improve their homes, it's going to be a real tough sell. Um, the residents in the city are very seriously overtaxed considering what their wages are as some of the people here have discussed today but um, I think that one thing that can be done is a volunteer coordinator could be placed in the mayor's office 
and could seek volunteers to come out and help people. I think it's time for people to realize that a lot of these properties in the city are vacant and a lot of the other properties, they only have one person living in them. And uh, if the people here were hitting doors, then they know that there's just, the flight from this city is unbelievable. And, and in order to improve property in this city, we have to create a livable wage base. We've all discussed disposable income here. There is none. And when, when you talk to people and they tell you how pressed they are, I mean, maybe it's time to just realize that maybe the blight is caused by the mismanagement of the city. And yes, we do have good residents. But I think the, uh, the real only solution is the federal funds are going to be cut for the grant programs. That's coming. That's down the road. The federal government's broke. And I think the only real answer here is to put a volunteer coordinator in the mayor's office and possibly to ask the courts and the district attorney's office to take non-threatening, non-violent offenders and ask them to do a six-month stipend in, uh, in these uh, groups and uh, let's try to turn the city around. And uh, I think it's time for the city itself to begin investing in itself, but it's, it's very hard considering the debt load the city has. Joe, we're back to you. Joe. Joe, lucky Joe. Joe. Joe and Joe. Well, this is a two-part question. Uh, oh. and you've addressed parts of it, I think, all of you have so far, but maybe we can expand on it just a little bit. So I'll ask Joe first. What do you see as the city's biggest problem the residents of Scranton face today, and also what are their biggest strengths they have today? <clears throat> I, I go back to my opening statement of uh, the best of times, the worst of times. Um, we can we can walk uh, i'm going to i'm going to go with the best the best of times the strengths uh, let's just walk out let's walk out your front door here joe at ectv uh, go to your right go to your left and 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 look uh we have we have a mall we have a vibrant downtown uh i be, i truly believe it's a vibrant downtown because of that mall uh, when the mall was first built i was the director of community development and the naysayers were, it's going to be an island unto itself. It's just going to sit there and do nothing. Uh, well, that was in 1990, 1992. Uh, you look at it now, we have, uh, not only is the downtown a vibrant uh, downtown, but it's also becoming a neighborhood. Uh, people are, are living here. A lot of improvements have been made to a lot of the buildings that have been out empty. And so we have, we have a, uh, a, a central city that is somewhere uh, that everybody really can, it really migrates to, comes to, uh, including, including myself and my family. Um, the second part, Joe, you're asking what's the bad part about well, yeah, the, the worst of problem in the Yeah, the stuff. worst of times, best, well, I, I would, as far as um, the worst of times, what we're facing with is act, obviously is our, is our tax base. Uh, our tax base is just, uh, it's just, it's taken us to uh, our knees of, of what we can do. Do we want to cut the taxes? Sure, we want to cut the taxes. But everything, like I said, starts in that building. It starts in City Hall. It starts with the governing body, which is the mayor and council, and it extends to the unions of the city. We have to work together. We have to sit in there, and we have to be transparent. We have to be approachable. We have to be accessible and to everybody. Uh, if I could just say something before I start to answer the question. I, I think for far too long, we, we, there's too much negativity in this town. We've got to start taking a look at what's good about this town. That, 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 that's my attitude. You know, I, I listened to negativity for six years on city council, and uh, one of the reasons I'm running is because we have good things in this city. I think, that, I think we've got to focus more on that than the negativity. Now, the question was, what is the... The biggest problem. The biggest, the biggest pro strength. Strength. Uh, I'm, I'm going to borrow from Joe. I think, I think the downtown is a tremendous strength. Uh, I, I like what the mayor did with the downtown. I like what he did with the parks. Uh, my son, actually, while, while going to the medical school, lived in the Connell building. They did an unbelievably good job there. I mean, I can remember that building when I was a kid going in there. Uh, very nice. So I, I think it's, I think it's a str our, our strength is the downtown. There is a community here. And my understanding is that possibly there will be a grocery store someday in the downtown because now we've got younger people and I think mostly driven by the medical school coming into the downtown and some professionals and we have the high-rises uh, so it's 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 a mixed bag there uh, 
the thing that I think that we, we didn't do well enough was we neglected the neighborhoods, and uh, that's why we all talk about blight, and that's where it is in the neighborhood. So I think we need to get back into the neighborhoods. But I don't think anybody's disagreed with the biggest problem facing the city is our finances. Uh, we, I don't even know if there's a name for our bond status. It's below junk status, I know that. So we have to change that. And uh, I mentioned it, I think, on Sunday. I, a bank came up from D.C. to speak to me, and uh, I asked them, I said, what would bring the bank banking community to bank to, back to us? And their answer to me was, is, is your mayor and council have got to come up with a realistic budget. Uh, they don't believe, and, and this is one bank from D.C. and a CFO from a bank here locally, they don't believe that we're going to get a million dollars from the nonprofits. Uh, I don't believe that either. I don't think we're going to get a million dollars from the nonprofits. I think, you know, the University of Scranton gives what they give, and, and they, get, they get the bad rap, but they give more than anybody. Uh, but I think what we could, oh, God, okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Got cut off there again. What was that question again? The, what do you see as the city of Scranton's biggest uh, strength and biggest problem? Um, the biggest problem I think that the city of Scranton has is that they have a population base that has absolutely no idea what's going on in their city government. And, um, you know, we've talked about the downtown and we've talked about nonprofits and we've talked about a multitude of development and you know, the truth of the matter is most of this stuff is being done with state funds. The city hasn't invested in itself. I think it's, uh, it's quite obvious uh, when the commuter tax was turned down by the courts that if we were in a court of law today and we were listening to the statements being offered here at this table today, they wouldn't stand. There'd be people going to jail. Um, and you know, as far as our greatest strength, our greatest strength is our history the iron furnaces, Mr. Scranton making rails there, and the same gentleman died in the, there trying to get the slag out of the molds. Um, Mr. Mitchell, labor leader, great labor leader. Our mining heritage, which proved that there's not, a, there's not a group of people in this country that can work harder than the people in this valley. We've proved it. And you know, the other thing is our rail history. And just how much Scrantonians and people around this valley are willing to go to the wall time after time after time. But you know, the one thing we really lack is leadership. And, and one of our major problems is that we've allowed politics to take standing over fact. And I think that if the people in Scranton were to listen to the statements of these candidates and look back and find out what fact was, I think you'd change the way you're gonna vote in May. Thank you. I think the, the biggest challenge or problem facing the, the residents of the city, and all of us would absolutely agree, I would imagine, are, are, is, are the taxes. I mean, if there's anything that we hear, maybe I hear that more than potholes, but certainly the taxes. And part of what I, has come into full relief, I think most of us know this, but perhaps not at this level of detail or pay as much attention, but we've had April 15th come and go. And if you look at your tax bill, when you look at the breakdown of what you pay, over 50%, if you're a Scrantonian, over 50% of what you pay goes to the school district. Then the next highest amount that you pay goes to the county. And the least, of your, the least burdensome part of your tax bill goes to the city. My argument is that 100% you know, of the people that live in the city of Scranton benefit from the services that the city provides. However you want to break down the other percentages for both the county and the school district um, is not my, my argument to make. But I will say that... Um, you know, we also look at one of the things that was also amazing is that about somewhere on the order of 74% of the business privilege and mercantile tax goes to the school district. Um, and so when we look at what it is that we pay and what it is that we expect, I know that the taxes are burdensome. Our property taxes in the city are actually fairly reasonable. Um, the wage tax we hear a lot about, but one full percent of that goes to the school district. Uh, and so I think the city does a pretty decent job of, uh, of 
of providing some of those services for the money that you pay. What I will say, however, though, uh oh, 30 second mark, is uh, um, that people don't mind paying taxes all the time if they know where their money's going and how that it gets invested. And so what I will say is the best part and the strength of this community is that I think that if you put in a little bit of sweat equity, that you get an unbelievable return on your investment. My experience here has been incredibly welcoming, uh, very encouraging. And a lot of the things that I've done since I moved here, whether it was starting a, founding a community garden, starting a book festival in downtown Scranton, hosting a women and families health fair in Southside, was all inspired by things like the Jazz Festival, La Festa, First Friday, the office um, convention. So those are, I think, the, the things that make this, this area unique and strong. Who gets this? Closing? Who's next? Closing uh, statement. Closing statement? No, no, we're going to one more question. Oh, okay. Okay. I think Bill Church. Okay. okay. The term leadership has been used several times uh, this evening. And the most exceptional form of leadership, as everyone knows, is leadership by example. I think one of the candidates mentioned that. So the question is, what example or examples will you set, and how will, and how will your cabinet do the same? Well, again, I think people, people see me on... TV for six years, they, they know what kind of leader I am. I'm, I'm a hard worker. I, I've always been a hard worker. I don't think I've ever had any less than two jobs in my life, sometimes three. Uh, and I was fortunate because we, m both myself and my wife, wife worked very hard that our children were able to go, you know, one to be a lawyer, one's go hopefully going to be a doctor and, and a school teacher be because we worked hard. Uh, the cabinet, I think, I think that's where some of the problems lie. Uh, we need to put qualified people in the jobs, and I think that's where we failed. I, I go back to uh, when Mr. Doherty first took office, I think he had a really, really good business administrator. His name was Leonard Krzyzewski. Uh, I worked with him on council. Uh, I don't think he could tolerate the politics in this city. That's probably why he left. But he was, he was making a salary, I think, approximately of $80,000, and some people thought that was exorbitant. But you know what? I think he was worth it. He did, he did a good job. Uh, I think to date, I'm, I'm not quite sure, maybe one of the candidates here would know, I, I think the business administrator is making fifty three or $55,000 a year. Uh, in order to get a qualified individual, and I, I think I stated this Sunday, is, oh, you know, we'd have to get somebody brilliant coming out of college that would be willing to take that salary, or somebody that you know, is near retirement age and just wants to come back and help our city. So I, I think your, your cabinet heads, you, you, def you, you definitely need to have qualified individuals. Uh, I think we all know there's politics in Scranton, there's politics everywhere. But if you're going to hire somebody, uh, you, need, you need to hire somebody qualified because I don't want to be sitting in the office of mayor and my staff doesn't know what they're doing because that's going to make me look bad. We're, we're going to hire qualified people. I've already went to a CFO from the bank, I think I told you, a president of a uh, bank and a executive search individual to ask them, when I become mayor, will you interview the candidates for the Office of Business Administrator? And I just focus on the Office of Business Administrator because I, I think it's one of the most important positions. Um, I, I keep getting the stop, stop sign there. All right, thank you. And that, that question was again? Uh, leadership by example is the, is the best form of leadership. And what, uh, what example would you set in your cabinet in leadership? Well, I think that um, an example of leadership would be that uh, I believe it's time for uh, the mayor to come to all council meetings, every, every council meeting. I think a sign of leadership would be electing a council in the city of Scranton that uh, had the ability to work with the mayor. Um, I think another sign of leadership would be to uh, be honest with the residents of this city and to invest in the people who live here. I think we hear a lot about leadership, but uh, to be quite honest with you, uh, we don't find out what leadership's done in this city for at least 10 years or sometimes longer after they've left. Because the city doesn't incur $148 million in long-term debt with leadership, and I'm not talking about the authorities. And when we start talking about a council and a mayor, I think we need to ask the council and the mayor how we, how we did not fund the municipal pensions and allowed them to run a hundred million dollars short. And then when we start talking about leadership, we have to make a determination why economic and community development money is spent in the wrong places and not enhancing the neighborhoods. And when we start talking about leadership, we have to ask why 
We've redeveloped the downtown for decades over and over again and allowed our neighborhoods to languish in disrepair. And we also have to ask, if we're looking for leadership, why we've allowed the city's population base to decline where it is today and why the Scranton Abington Planning Association's comprehensive plan was never enacted by a city that needs jobs and development. I'll say a few things about leadership. I think the first thing that we need to look at is the internal leadership, and I think that might speak directly, most directly to your question, which is how, what would you do as far as being mayor with the staff and the administration? I think making sure that you hit the ground running, uh, making sure that there is an, a viable, well-articulated plan that is shared and communicated effectively with everybody in, not just in the administration, but that runs through all of the departments. I think that, uh, that those, are, uh, those are incredibly important and necessary. I remember when I was the Chief of Staff at Lackawanna County, one of the things that I was responsible for doing, in addition to the budget hearings and doing the contract negotiations with the unions, was to manage an, uh, upwards of, or probably in the vicinity of about 60 departments. And at the time, there was approximately 1,500 employees at the county. Now, I was, they were not directly all reportable to me, but at the same time, what we needed to do for the commissioners was to make sure that their plan, their needs, and their desires were clearly communicated across the board amongst very different types of departments. So I think in that regard, that is what, where I would come in talking to the staff, making sure that everyone's playing from the same playbook. I think secondly, part of what I also offer as part of my plan is how you lead externally. So I've proposed hosting and, and assembling a Scranton Summit that would assemble all of the stakeholders in the community, whether that's city council, school district, elected officials, neighborhood watch groups, small business owners, and the like, and make sure that in addition to saying this, this is what we might need from you and listening to what their concerns are is also saying this is what we need from you as these stakeholders. In order to make the city whole and flourishing and thriving, we need your participation, but this is what I'm going to tell you if I'm elected mayor, what we need to focus on first. And I think the third really is the intangibles, is who is it that you want at the helm? Who do you want to be the person that is meeting with the, the businesses that might be looking to move into town? Who's meeting with the financial institutions? And I think for me, being the quasi poster child of where we, uh, of who we want to attract into this area, I think I'm, I'm, I'm a good candidate for that job. Okay, we're going. Did he As you're married, you have to answer the question. Then we're going to excuse me and keep the microphone there. You'll do the first closing statement. Okay. okay. I can roll right into that, Joe. I'm going to roll right into it. So okay. Actually, you get four minutes. You're a lucky man. Okay. All right. We'll take advantage of that. Um, all right. As, um, it's, a, it's a simple fix uh, as far as leadership. Uh, whatever leadership we've had uh, over the last 40 years, I go back to the Home Rule Charter. I go back to the Home Rule Charter because the Home Rule Charter has in it uh, that the mayor may attend council meetings. Uh, my first my first order of business would be to go to the council meetings and amend that home rule charter uh, to say that the mayor shall attend council meetings. With that being said, uh, the mayor being in those council meetings, that's the beginning stage of getting us to the point where we have to be. The mayor gets there now. How, how could you not, how could you not be a part, the governing body as the home rule charter is put, to, written, it says the mayor and council. Everybody out there in the city, you all, uh, you're working, you work with your companies, you work with, uh, you're on volunteer boards. What would happen if you went to your company or your board and said, well, this group of people is going to do things one way, and this guy, this girl is going to do it another way? Uh, where, how do you bring that together? It's a simple fix. We start with the Home Rule Charter. We start with the governing body, we get everybody in council chambers at one time. And that starts with the mayor. That's the person that needs to initiate that process. That process. Once we have that, once we have that and we're settled, the, the mayor then needs to approach the unions. And, he had, and that person, the mayor, as your mayor, I will approach the unions and bring them into the scenario. So we have for the sake of uh, 
lots of better words, and we've heard this en enough times, we have the whole circus under the big tent, and we can deal with what we have to deal with. We're transparent. We have the ac accessibility now of ECTV to be there in council chambers, and now the entire city gets to see what is happening all at one time under one roof. So the leader, as far as, as your mayor, that is the job of the chief executive officer, the CEO, needs to bring that together. The mayor, that is the person that's the approachable person, the person that you'll see me on the street of, of downtown in the neighborhoods, uh, talking to the people, being accessible to the people, understanding what they need. So, the, so leadership for me as your mayor is, is very simple. It starts with City Hall, and then it branches out from there to the rest of the community, to the rest of the city. No. So I get to take a drink, Joe, before closing yes, statement. You Wet your whistle. <laughs> I'll be brief. Thank you. <laughs> I started uh, talking about, about myself, third generation, and I, I better close uh, talking about uh, the better half of me, who is also a third generation, my wife, She's been here, uh, her family, third generation uh, from the north end of town in a small little section of the north end called The Notch. Uh, we've raised uh, uh, four, four great kids in, uh, we, and for the last 30 years uh, living in another small section of Greenridge called The Plot. Um, now I hope that gets me into the house tonight because uh, she had to work late tonight and the kids couldn't be here. Um, however, with that being said, um, I, uh, again, thank, I thank ECTV, uh, I, I thank my, my colleagues, we've, we've been down this road a few times now and I think we have one or, more, one or two more times we're going to get together and we've learned from each other here and I think you've seen tonight that we, we are trying to put some uh, ideas out there. We need, we need you the people, we, I cannot do it as your mayor, I cannot do it alone, uh, you the people need to need to help need to pitch in um, I, 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 and I as your mayor I will be there to work with you whatever has to be done in closing uh, I, I want to make I want to continue as your mayor to make this city uh, safe and prosperous we have to work hard together to make it safe and prosperous and last but not least, a place that we can enjoy living in. There's a lot of activity in this, in this town, and we want to improve on that. The arts, the culture we have here, the nonprofits. So there's two things. I want to continue to protect you as the citizens, and I want to continue to make uh, your life enjoyable here in the city. And I humbly ask for your vote on May 21st, Tuesday. Thank you. Well, thanks to everybody on the panel here, and uh, thanks to ECTV and Mark Migliori. Uh, I go back a little bit with Mark. I remember on, on council, um, they wanted to take the cameras out of out of council chambers. I happened to be there that day, and I went over and uh, stopped him, called Mr. Finnerty. He came down, and I think Mr. Fiorini was a little bit mad at me at that time. But I, I, I think I think we need to have open and, and, and honest government. I think it's time for that. Uh, I want to thank my family because I think anybody up here knows it's a lot of stress on your family running for any office. Uh, my wife, Kim, my, my daughter, Lindsay, my son, Bill, and uh, my son, Patrick. Uh, even my grandson, I have a grandson named Cooper. He's three years old. Uh, he'll, he'll see signs. He'll say, can I go help put the signs up? So, and I, I don't see him as much as, as, I, as I like to now. But it, it's, it's, it's a good experience. It's always been a good experience running. Uh, I think, as I said before, I have a track record. There's no guesswork with me. Uh, six years on council, I know each and every department. I know how they work. I think when it does come time to negotiate contracts, uh, who, who are they more apt to deal with? I think they would be more apt to deal with me because they know me, they trust me, they know what I'm like. I, I'm, I've been honest my whole life. I think everybody knows that, but, but they know me. And I think that, you know, at the time to comes for the contracts, they're going to be fighting for their membership, but I'm going to be fighting for the citizens of Scranton. And, and I, I think that that's important to know. Uh, I, w I want to thank you again for allowing us here. As Joe said, we probably have one more to go. Uh, 
and I humbly and I respectfully ask for your vote on uh, May 21st. Thank you. Um, yes, my name is Lee Morgan. You know, I'd, I'd like to ask everybody to go on Facebook and research me, Lee Morgan, look me up by name, um, and you'll see that I have a real development plan. Um, I just think that I have a real understanding of what's taken place in the city over an extended period of time. I am a resident who has participated for a very long time. Um, and I just think in order to change the city, we have to remove politics from city government. And that's our problem. That's what's led Scranton to where it is, is all this politics. We've got to be honest with the residents, and we've got to tell them where we stand. I think it's important to elect a mayor that's going to go to council meetings. I think it's important for the next mayor to go to Harrisburg and lobby the legislature to try to get some legislation that's going to help the city to redevelop the city and create, help to create jobs. The tax problem is going to be an overwhelming issue. And I don't see a commuter tax coming. And to be quite bluntly honest, I see a great possibility of a receivership taking place relatively soon. And we'll know that when we see them try to put the next budget together because the, the gap is so large. So I just like to ask people to forget about the politics, pick a candidate who knows what's going on, who's participated at council meetings for decades, and read my plan. It's a, I, I compressed it as much as I could. And, and we've got to get a new vision for the city, and we've got to move in a new way. And maybe you can start to make that happen. Thank you. Thank you again to ECTV and to my fellow candidates for this uh, engaging conversation this evening. I'll just say that, that really, I think everything that I've done since I came to the city and moved here has led up to this particular moment. I think that for me, this is the absolute best way for me to give back to a city that has embraced me, uh, has welcomed me, has provided me with unbelievable fodder to create and generate new things, new ideas, new vision, and in this capacity, a, a new plan. I, I have a well-articulated plan that's on our website, so like Lee, invite you to, to uh, look that up there for some additional detail. But really, I am really looking forward to getting started on this job. I'm a little bit antsy and, uh, uh, and also excited. I think that it is a tremendous job. We know that it will probably be likely a thankless job. One of the things that I find rather disheartening is how cr crazy people think most of us are for even running for this office. And to me, that, that speaks, again, what I said sort of in my opening comments about the, the crisis and confidence in this area. I don't see it. I know that we have real problems. I don't see it being that bad. I mean, I'm experiencing and living in the city and watching people live in the city in ways that, uh, that are uh, fruitful and uh, excited and, um, and really open to what we can do in the future. I think, um, you know, I, I love part of what I want to do as mayor, in addition to all the things that I've been saying as far as my plan and the very specific level of detail that, uh, that we all discuss as far as the, the city's needs and challenges is that I love to brag about Scranton. I love to sing the praises of the city. All the people that I grew up with and have gone to school with who asked me, well, what are you doing in Scranton? I can rattle off a million things right out of the gate. I love being uh, a cheerleader for the city. And I chose to move here. I did not grow up here. I've chosen to stay, and I'm just asking that you choose me on November, uh, on November <laughs> right? On May 21st. Thank you. <laughs> I heard the ECTV thank many times, but ECTV would like to thank the candidates as well for coming. We want to remind everybody to make sure they vote on primary election day. And uh, we, now we can do the applause because the closing arguments have been done. And I think they've all done a fine job. I think everybody here, as, as well as those viewing at home, are better prepared than they were to vote before this debate discussion started. And again, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Hey, did WYOK call you guys? Yeah, that's uh, the 16th. Welcome to ECTV's uh, candidates uh, debate. Tonight, uh, we're going to be talking with uh, Marcel Lisi, a candidate for mayor of Scranton. And we did invite uh, Gary Lewis, his opponent on the Republican ticket, but we're informed he was unavailable. So uh, Marcel was kind enough to uh, continue uh, to come here, and what we're going to do is we're going to ask him some questions that we would ask in a normal debate. 
Two is going to be our magic number. We're going to give them an opening statement for two minutes, uh, the questions two minutes to answer, and then the closing statement of two minutes as well. So first of all, uh, Marcel, on behalf of ECTV and all of our viewers at home and the studio audience here, we want to thank you for, for coming in this evening to, uh, to address the issues that are facing the next mayor of the city of Scranton. You're welcome, and thank you for having me here. I, I, it, it's a pleasure. Okay. Uh, we, if you'd like to start, uh, give us a, an opening statement. Uh, tell us about yourself a little bit for a couple minutes here, and the voters can uh, you know, get to know you kind of up close and personal. Okay, awesome. Uh, my name is Marcel Lisi. I was born and raised in the city of Scranton. I'm a current resident. I'm a West Sider by nature, but I'm a resident of Kaiser Valley. Uh, I graduated from West Scranton High School in 2006 and uh, Marywood University in 2010. Uh, I hold a bachelor's degree in history, political science, and pre-law. Uh, I studied in Oxford dur during the summer of 2009 at St. Clair's College, so I have traveled a bit. I've been to every major city between Chicago and London, so you know I kind of have a handle on the situation of what works and what doesn't work in major cities. Um, right now I'm trying to lower taxes in Scranton because it's getting to the point where it's turning into a ghost town. Our population's declining. Businesses and families literally build around the city of Scranton. And so I believe that, well I think that if we lower taxes that we'll start attracting more families, more businesses to the city that will expand our tax base. So as our tax rates go down, our revenue for the city actually goes up and so we'll have more money to fix the roads, to uh, maintain bridges, to hire more employees if we need them. And that's basically it. That's why I'm running for mayor. Okay, well, thank you very much. Well, let's, let's start with the, the very first question. What do you see uh, as Scranton's biggest problem and probably its largest strength that the, we face today? Its biggest problem is the high taxes. The taxes are just too damn high. And right now, like I said before in my opening statement, businesses and families are fleeing the city. Our tax base is eroding. So every year, in fact, you can't even plan a budget because every year, say you're getting so much money this year, next year, it's going to be a lot less because people are leaving the city. And so we have to change that. The high taxes is what's killing us, and we know that. Most of my family left the city. Most of my friends left the city. I'm ready to leave too myself. But that's what we have to do. We have to lower taxes. We have to expand our tax base. We have to give people an incentive to own homes in the city, to own businesses to be anchors in the community. Now our greatest strength, I, I think, right now it's the will of the people. People, this is why I'm running for mayor, I'm getting so much grassroots support out there, like, it's, it's unbelievable. I go door to door, I stand on porches, I talk to people on the street, on the sidewalk, and they're all saying the same thing, Marcel, we're being taxed out of our own city. Uh, thank you for that answer. Oh, I, I, I think I maybe know the answer to the next question. But, okay. Uh, uh, you kind of uh, maybe you gave it away. I'm not sure. But what would your first priority be when you get into office? Lower taxes, bring more jobs back to the city, and that's it. Okay. I, I, I had a feeling <laughs> that was going to be the answer. Uh, uh, now, when we talked a little bit a while ago about the, the, the biggest problems and the and the and the largest strengths. Uh, we, we all know that it's getting on your theme of taxes. There's all kinds of reasons or blame to go around. Uh, what do you see the role of the municipal unions in Scranton's financial recovery process for the future? I'm not one to play the blame game. I mean, Scranton, it's been on the downhill for decades, and everybody has a role in that, whether it's unions or otherwise. But I think we need to work with the unions. We need union concessions. Uh, the court awards, I think the unions need to step back a little bit. Because if we keep raising taxes and more people keep leaving the city, eventually cops and firemen are going to get laid off because there's not going to be any money to pay them with. I mean, you can stand up here and ask me for $100 all day and I can even sign a contract, but if I don't have it in my wallet, I don't have it in my wallet and you're not going to get it. Mm -hmm. And so it's the same thing with the unions. If they want money, they're going to have to work with us, otherwise they're going to lose their jobs. Mm -hmm. Well, along those same lines, everyone, nearly everyone, is familiar with Scranton's financial situation. Uh, so what are, what are your qualifications to shepherd the city to a position of liquidity in the future? I'm not afraid. I'm, I'm a young Republican. I get that. But this is why I'm running. The city is in such a dire state right now, it calls for somebody like me. And with my background, I serve for two senators and a congressman, uh, Senator Casey, Senator Specter, and Congressman Kanjorski. And I talk to constituents all throughout northeastern Pennsylvania. 
And so I, I understand what people want, I understand what they need, and especially the people in my hometown of Scranton, they need jobs. Businesses need low taxes to provide good jobs with. Homeowners need low property taxes, otherwise people abandon these bigger homes in the city and they get turned into apartments and that's where the blight comes from. And that's where a lot of cri a crime comes from too. Well, you know, speaking of blight, uh, and you know, every city has their, their share of blight, and it seems to be increasing in the last decade or so, I would think, maybe even two now. But it what increases with the taxes. <laughs> <laughs> well, that could be one of the reasons I as well. But what, what do you think, uh, or what will you do to improve the, the current blighted neighborhoods so they don't continue to negatively impact the market value, especially of real estate in the city of Scranton? You're preaching to the choir, but every neighborhood is becoming blighted because people are losing their homes. We don't have decent jobs around here. People can't maintain a household. People just walk away, especially older people on fixed incomes. Every time the taxes jump up $1,000 a year in the city, you know, some little old lady trying to keep her home, all of a sudden she can't afford to pay some young guy to cut the grass. She can't afford to paint the house. She might not even be able to afford to pay the taxes, and so she loses the house, and it becomes a blighted property. We need to lower taxes. We need to attract families to the city to live in these bigger homes, not turn them into apartments. That's how you solve the blight problem. Well, what do you think the city can do to encourage uh, property owners to improve the appearance of their properties, aside from legislation or grants? Well, or you, you know the answer to this already. Give people more of their own money back. Lower the taxes. If people had more money, they'd be able to fix up their homes, fix up their cars, take their family out downtown to an eatery, have a great time, spend money in the city. People need more of their own money, and they need decent jobs around here. Um, well, I don't think anybody's really going to disagree with people having more money, and we know that taxes sometimes are, you know, they, they cut into what we call real income. Exactly. You know, this, uh, discretionary income in particular, if yep. I'm not mistaken. And, uh, you know, speaking of income and some, uh, uh, some economic issues, you know, what strategies would you employ or will you employ to ensure a, we call a strong, synergistic, and successful working relationship synergistic. between the mayor's office and the city council? Synergistic, that's the first time I heard that word. But in order to foster a better relationship between the mayor and the council, we gotta work with, we gotta work with each other. The, may, the mayoral branch, the council branch, we gotta sit down. The mayor needs, attend, needs to attend council meetings. He needs to be there. He needs to be talking to the people. He needs to look them in the face and say, I understand what you're talking about. I know what the problem is. Come over here, let me write down your information. Let me go see the problem physically. Let me be a hands-on manager. That's what, that's what kind of mayor we need. And those are the kind of council people we need, too. A lot of people go to council, and they get yelled at by, by certain individuals I'm not going to name. But they get yelled at, and they don't want to attend anymore. That's why you don't see as many people as you used to go into council meetings. We need to be helpful. We need to help people in the community, not scare them away. We need to be more involved. The mayor needs to participate with city council. Well, and also along those lines, then, do you think, I, th I believe the city charter allows the mayor to attend the council meetings. But do you think it should be mandatory for the mayor to attend council meetings? I don't think it should be mandatory. The mayor should do it on his, on his own time. He should be a volunteer doing this. And if he doesn't, the people of Scranton should vote that mayor out. Simple as that. We have the power to get rid of that mayor. If we don't like him not attending the council meetings, he's going to know about it. And in fact, I voted against Chris Darty when he ran last election, and I'm proud of that. Mm -hmm. <coughs> what... Uh, Getting back to the financial challenges at the city, because, and I know that's, you're tying that in with the tax issue as well, which is justifiable. What is your plan to address this ongoing financial challenge? Well, I'm going to sound like a broken record here, okay. but you're going to know the answer. Like I said before, if we lower taxes, our tax rates go down, obviously, and the revenue for the city is going to go up because more people and more businesses want to live here. People want to invest here. People want to People will be able to afford to live in the Scranton community because there's going to be decent jobs here, because there's going to be more businesses, and so they can start fixing up their homes. The property taxes are going to be lower, so they can be able to afford to live in a home. And that's how you fix the financial problem. And the city's going to get more money if we expand our tax base. We need more people in Scranton, more businesses, not less. We, I don't want to scare anybody away. And my opponent, Gary Lewis, he's the bankruptcy guy. Oh, let's Scranton declare bankruptcy. Let's see what happens. Let's roll the dice. Well, we're going to be giving our freedom away to some, some court out there saying, OK, we're going to decide what your tax rates are. And then the creditors are going to come in. And they're going to gobble up all, all the city's assets, all the taxpayers' assets. And then Gary Lewis, who owns a, 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 a debt uh, uh, whatever firm, I, I don't even know what it is, it's a made up job, I believe, 
but he's, go he's going to benefit from the city declaring bankruptcy. His business is going to benefit from this, and when the taxpayers are going to get like a, who knows, a 100% increase next year in their taxes, he, and he's the mayor, when he, when he gets done in his four years, he's going to skip town and say, ha ha, look at I built my business around Scranton's demise. I don't think we need that. <coughs> I'm against bankruptcy. I'm against commuter taxes. I'm against further taxation on our citizens in Northeast Pennsylvania and in Scranton especially. We've had enough. <coughs> well, in that ca aside from the bankruptcy issue, which he has, your opponent, uh, Mr. Lewis, has proposed, I believe. Why should the residents of Scranton vote, let's say, for you and not for him? Well, for one thing... Or he's your only opponent, I believe. Yeah, I wish he was here. Yeah, but well, uh, so do I. On, honestly, he's the bankruptcy guy. If we declare bankruptcy, who's going to want to come here and live? Who's going to want to start a business in a bankrupt city? Is someone from, like, Ohio or Virginia going to go, oh, gee, Scranton just declared bankruptcy. Better hitch up the wagon and go ahead there and start a, start a, start a home, start a business. Nobody's going to do that. It's going to scare more people away. It's going to hurt us in the long run. It's going to ruin our image. Already there's a TV show called The Office out there that makes fun of us on national TV. And I'm sure it's aired in other countries too. So the whole world knows that Scranton's a screwed up place. So we can't have any more of that. But people should vote for me because I'm trying to genuinely help them. I'm trying to make a future in Scranton. I'm trying to invest here. But because of the taxes, because of all this corruption, and the good old boys network being run downtown in City Hall with Chris Doherty, I'm being pushed out of my own hometown. Like I said, most of my friends left the city. And I'm not that old. Most of my family left the city. People don't come back. They leave. And they're happy that they left. They're better off. So I need to change that. I need to lower taxes as your mayor. Well, that brings me to leadership. And the most exception, exceptional form of leadership, as we know, is leadership by example. So what example or examples would you set, and how will your cabinet uh, follow suit to do the same? I have many, many people in the community that I've spoken with. They want to actually volunteer their services to the city in any capacity that we can manage. So there's free labor out there, and there's a lot of retired people. They bring a lot of knowledge to the table, and they want to help the city because they want to live here. They want to stay here. And so I'm going to work with them. And also, I'm not going to take a pay raise. Whatever the mayor's making now, that's what I'm going to make. I'm not going to take the extra 10 grand a year. I'm not going to take the extra 15 after that or whatever council and all these other, uh, all these other people are suggesting. Honestly, uh, is the common citizen of Scranton getting a pay raise? No. Why should the mayor? Why should anybody else in the city get a pay raise if the taxpayer is not getting a pay raise? That's leadership by example. Mm -hmm. Not only that, the parking meters downtown, I'm against that. It keeps shoppers out of the downtown. It pushes them to go up to Dixon City Music and Taylor to go shop. I do it myself. I don't want to pay for the damn meters. In fact, I park at the Steamtown Mall when I can because it's free. And like I said, with the taxes going up every year, and now you want to tax people with parking meters, it's like, who wants to pay more money to be in a place that they don't want to be? And the downtown's empty. Right now, we should get rid of parking meters. And if I have to, I'll saw down the parking meters myself personally. If you want to help me, gladly. You, you can meet me downtown if I'm the mayor. We'll saw them down together. Only at night. Only at night. <laughs> no, no. When I'm the mayor, it'll be during the day. People, people are going to see us. We're going to make the news. But uh, that's leadership by example. No, no, no uh, increase in pay for the mayor. Uh, I'll, I'll cut down the parking meters myself. And like I said, I'm, I'm a Republican. I'm a young Republican. I know I'm up against the wall here. You know, uh, the forces are against me in Scranton politics. But uh, I'm going to do what I have to do to help my city, help my hometown, help my family, help my neighborhood. Well, you know, a little while ago we talked about the, the, the synergistic uh, working of council. There's that word again. I know. I, <laughs> I wanted to use it a second time just to make sure you heard me. But council, as we know, is, uh, I, I'm not sure how to ask this. But I, I think they're responsible for the debacle of the Scranton Parking Authority, for the default. Now, with that said, what's your position on the Scranton Parking Authority? I and mean, we know about the meters, but on the Scranton Parking Authority and the, and the takeover by a receivership. Well, honestly, I, I think the, the Parking Authority should have been in charge, uh, the mayor should have been in charge of that from day one. Mm -hmm. Right now, it was in charge of, I forget the man's name, I have no idea. There's so many people under corruption charges right now and who are screwing up the city. But the parking authority, from my understanding, is not under council's leadership or under the city's. However, when they need money or they need a bailout, all of a sudden, okay, it's the city's problem now, it's the taxpayer's problem. So 
But the city needs to take control of the parking authority again. We can't let it be independently managed because honestly, they just don't give a damn about the Scranton taxpayer. They're running, they're running the business, they're running the parking authority into the ground. And so the city needs to take control of that again. And I would prefer the mayor's office to take control rather than council because you can have a, a more direct approach when you know bad things happen. Well, I think I agree with that. However, uh, it's my understanding that this is a federal, once you default on a loan and go into the bankruptcy, it's a, it's, it comes under federal jurisdiction, not city, municipal, or state jurisdiction. Yeah. So the question then is, what would be your plan to take back control of the parking authority? We'd have to review the parking authority top to bottom. In fact, that's some of my plan to uh, cut some of the, the debt, the waste, and the corruption uh, you know, uh, out of the city. I want to review every department you know, whether it's uh, fire, police, DPW, administration, the parking authority. And uh, I, want, I want to be a hands-on manager. I want to see what we can cut, what, how much money we can save. And uh, if I could, I'd like to pay off the parking authority's debt a little bit at a time. I'd like to work with the federal government, work with the courts, see if we can try to, you know, broker a break for the Scranton taxpayer because they're literally being bled to death. And I want to abolish the parking authority, practically. I want to gut it because, like I said, I want to get rid of these damn parking meters. Mm -hmm. <coughs> when, it, uh, when it comes to the mayor's office, and let's say, let's assume for now, you uh, win the primary and are elected in November, what would be your first priority as mayor? Lower the taxes. And how would you do that? Like I said, I want to review every city department. Mm -hmm. And like I said, I want to be a hands-on manager. I want to see where we can save money at. Mm -hmm. And as we're lower in taxes, we're starting to attract more businesses, more people to the city. So over time, you know, maybe a year, a couple years, over time, rather than long, long, long down the road, decades ahead, we're going to start lowering our tax rates and we're going to start raising more revenue for the city because we're going to be expanding our tax base. More people and more businesses are going to want to be in the city. So therefore, you have more people paying into the tax system. You have more revenue going to the city. That's how you fix the finances, not raising taxes, lowering them. That's going to be my first priority as mayor. Well, we know the taxes for any uh, form of government are the revenue side of, of the ledger, and expenses are the liability side. What would you do to control or reduce expenses? I would re review every city department. I honestly I can't tell you specifics right now because I'm not the mayor not mm -hmm. the, the mayor yet. I haven't been in those departments. I can't tell you what needs to be cut and this and that. I'm not in there yet. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to review the departments. I'm going to make the cuts. Okay. And I don't believe that the city should borrow money at all ever ever again because that's what got us in this problem in the first place. The city should live within its operating budget every year. The city should never borrow money. Because say it runs, runs short one year, we start borrowing money, what happens when you're short the next year? You gotta pay the interest plus the loan, and so now you're borrowing more money, and it turns into a vicious cycle until you turn into where we are now, Scranton, Pennsylvania. And so I don't believe city government should borrow money at all. It's not, it's, it's not, it shouldn't be their authority. I believe priv private sector should borrow money, not government, especially local government. They should live within their means, live within the operating budget. <coughs> So basically your platform is fiscal policy and responsibility. Yeah. Uh, true statement? Yeah. I think so too from listening. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it sounded that way. Uh, Mar uh, Marcel Lisi, a candidate for the Republican uh, Party for the uh, primary election, which is Tuesday, May 21st. Uh, with that said, I'd like you to do a, a closing statement. Okay. Uh, you know, you can, uh, I'm not a bad guy, so even if you go two and a half minutes, that's okay. Oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well. I'm going to lower your taxes as mayor, and I'm going to bring more businesses back to the city. In fact, Beretta Firearms is thinking about leaving the state of Maryland right now because the taxes are, are, are too high. Honestly, I would love to speak with the representatives of Beretta Firearms and tell them, come to Scranton, Pennsylvania, greatest city on earth. We can build your product. We have an overeducated workforce. We can meet your demand. We're the hub of the northeast. We got New York City to the east, Boston to the north. Uh, pick Pittsburgh to the west. We got Baltimore, D.C., Philadelphia to the south. This can be a manufacturing hub. This is where the job should be at. And so as mayor, I'm going to work hard to do that. I'm going to work hard to put big families back in big homes again. I want to lower taxes. I want a bigger community here, not a smaller community. We should attract people to the city, not scare them away. Okay, Marcel Lisi, uh, Republican candidate for mayor uh, for the primary election Tuesday, May 21st. 
We want, on behalf of ECTV, our viewers and our audience, we want to thank you for coming. Well, thank, thank you for you. sharing your views with us and, and uh, addressing all the issues that are facing, the important issues facing the city of Scranton I hope today. we can do this again soon. Well, we, we might be doing it one awesome. more time. Okay? All thank right. you, well, thank, thank you for coming. Thank you. I appreciate it. Good night, everybody.